Today's episode brought to you by Summit Professional Education. Unlock your potential with Summit Professional Education, your trusted partner for expert-led courses, flexible learning, and essential CEUs. Elevate your skills today at summiteducation.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today I've got a practice question for you. This is related to the non-systems section of the exam. So the non-systems, there are, I mean, all told, we're talking about 30 questions or so related to non-systems. We're looking specifically at therapeutic modalities today, somewhere between four and six questions on the NPTE related to therapeutic modalities. Now of note, these therapeutic modality questions could come in a variety of forms. You could get it in a a scenario-based item. You could get it in relation to a image or video-based item. Today, I have a text-based item for you, a standalone question related to therapeutic modalities. But in any case, somewhere between four and six questions related to this section of the non-systems. Just to review some of the other non-systems items you'll have to know, you have to know equipment devices and technology, therapeutic modalities, safety and protection, professional responsibilities, and research and evidence-based practice. So all told, there are five subtypes and somewhere around five questions or so related to each of these sections. There's somewhat of a range in all of them, but somewhere between 25 and 30 questions related to the non-systems. Now, just remember on test day, most of the time, if you find, say, the professional responsibilities or safety and protection, a lot of those are, we'll call them common sense, but they're things that you would encounter as a first year entry level, entry level practitioner, as an example, like uh, just a silly example, you should know that you shouldn't share patient protected health information uh, outside of those who need to know. Essentially only share what needs to be known with those that need to know. So that would be an example of a professional responsibilities question that you would absolutely need to have familiarity with in order to answer on test day. Today is related to therapeutic modalities. So therapeutic modalities, You need to know all of the different variety of therapeutic modalities, as well as the proper indications, contraindications, and safe use of each modality and why you would use it. And you'll find that that'll be extremely helpful on test days. So uh, without further ado, let's go and dive into our practice question here for today. As per our usual, I will read to you the question and then give you a moment to respond and then we will talk about it together. Here we go. A physical therapist is preparing to administer electrical stimulation to a patient's knee as part of their rehabilitation program. Which of the following conditions, if present, would be considered an absolute contraindication to the use of electrical currents in this patient? So again, a a physical therapist is preparing to administer e-stim to a patient's knee as a part of their rehab program. Which of the following conditions, if present, would be considered an absolute contraindication to the use of electrical currents in this patient? One, demand pacemaker. Two, denervated muscle. Three, third trimester of pregnancy. Or four, venous thrombosis in the calf. So we have one, demand cardiac pacemaker. Two, denervated muscle. Three, third trimester of pregnancy. And four, venous thrombosis in the calf. All of this is, the question is, which of these is an absolute contraindication to the use of electrical currents in this patient? So if you selected that fourth option, a venous thrombosis in the calf, you would be correct. So the presence of a venous or arterial thrombosis or thrombophlebitis is indeed a contraindication to the use of electrical currents as it is likely to cause vasodilation and increased circulation and therefore increase the risk of re- releasing the embolus into the system. And so obviously if you, if you release the, the thrombosis and it becomes an em- embolus, then it's going to travel into either the lungs or the brain or somewhere where it shouldn't go. And in that case, you're you're causing more harm than good. So certainly the presence of an untreated venous thrombosis in the calf would be uh, an absolute contraindication. These other ones are only contraindications for the use for under specific uses. For instance, the demand cardiac pacemaker, you would not use e-stim in the patient's on if they had a demand cardiac pacemaker in the regions of the cervical, thoracic, shoulder, upper, lumbar, or chest areas of the patient. So basically you don't want to put any electrical stimulation anywhere near that cardiac pacemaker. That being said, in the lower extremity, you would not have the risk 
of disrupting that demand pacemaker, that demand cardiac pacemaker. So therefore, the presence of a cardiac pacemaker would only be a contraindication if you were applying the electrical current to the cervical, thoracic, shoulder, upper lumbar, or chest areas of the patient. Also of note, you'd never place it on the neck or the carotid sinus. That would be ill-advised as well. Uh, for denervated muscle, the second option, denervated muscle electrical stimulation can actually be helpful is indicated in the presence of denervated muscle because it can prevent atrophy, especially if you're hoping that the muscle becomes renervated. So for instance, after some type of, of uh, I don't know, axon tamesis or neuropraxia, where you are hoping that the nerve regrows or comes back uh, comes back into full function, uh, using E-STEM over a, a denervated muscle can be helpful at reducing atrophy in the patient. And then finally, the third trimester of pregnancy, again, this is region specific, you would not apply E-STEM, it would be indeed a contraindication to apply E-STEM in the low back, the abdomen, or the hips of pregnant women, just because you don't want the electrical stimulation or electrical currents to harm the developing human fetus. And so in that case, you would not apply E-STEM anywhere near the low back, abdomen, or hips of a pregnant woman. However, you would be permitted to apply E-STEM at sites far distant to that. So for instance, in the knee, in the feet, perhaps in the shoulder, in the hands, all of those areas would be permitted. So again, just to review, which of the following conditions would this be an absolute contraindication of the use of electrical currents in this particular patient for a knee injury? So the correct answer is the presence of a venous thrombosis in the calf. That would be an absolute contraindication because of the risk that you could actually release the the thrombus to turn it into an embolus. <laughs> you don't want it. You don't want that blood clot to start floating through the system and cause a pulmonary embolism or worse, a cerebrovascular accident, among other things. All right, so there you go. This question again related to the contraindications and your knowledge of the contraindications for electric the use of electrical currents in patients. And again, denervated muscle, that is an indication for the use of electrical currents. Whereas these other ones, you have some, some strings attached. Demand cardiac pacemaker, uh, you would avoid it on the cervical, thoracic, upper lumbar, or chest areas of the patient, as well as the shoulder. And then with pregnancy, same, you would avoid it in the low back, abdomen, or hips, so as not to send electrical currents through the developing human fetus there. So uh, correct answer here, the presence of a venous thrombosis in the calf would indeed be a contraindication because it could cause the 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 thrombus to break loose and float and cause a pulmonary embolism or something else. So, all right. So there you go. There's your practice question for today. If you haven't yet, be sure wherever it is you're listening to this podcast, whether it be on Spotify, Apple iTunes, or podcast, it only takes like one second. Leave us a quick five-star review. It really helps as we're trying to get the word out about the NPT podcast. Be sure to check out all of the other questions we've got. So as you are studying I'm sure you've discovered that your found time is an essential essential part of your study process. And what I mean by that is that you usually, like a lot of you are probably listening to this while you're exercising, perhaps you're driving on your way to work or clinical, or perhaps you're just washing the dishes or just, just chilling in your recliner, whatever it is. This is your found time when you are studying during time that would otherwise be lost or wasted. So using that found time can be critical in improving your study habits and that's where this podcast can really help. So be sure to check out all the other episodes we've got. And like I said, if you haven't haven't yet, please leave us a review wherever it is you're listening to this podcast. Plus, if you want to grab a hold of any of our freebies or be the first to get discounts to any of our courses, go to ptfinalexam.com slash podcast. Sign up there to get the latest and greatest and all of our freebies at ptfinalexam.com slash podcast. All right, we'll bring it to a conclusion. We'll crane fist bumps all around. I'll catch you all in the next one. Take good care of yourselves, everyone. Keep a grin on your chin. Talk to you soon. Take care.